The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, June 9th, 2022, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our presenter, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Welcome, Sam. Hey, Kristen. Good to see you. Today, we're gonna be talking about shifting the shifting energy landscape. Take us back to the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. How has the oil market changed since this time? Yeah, so it's been it's been a process, right? And it's going to continue to be a process over time. It's it's not something that's going to be slow, and it's something that was pretty dramatic. Uh, Russia exported a lot of energy, whether it was natural gas, whether it was crude oil, whether it was distilled distilled products, right? Uh, gasoline, diesel, etc., uh, to Europe, and that demand dried up, and it continues to dry up rather rapidly as Europe continues down the path of sanctions right sanctions go on very quickly they don't come off very quickly uh, you can think of cuba venezuela iran you know these you know when you begin to have these types of sanctions put on it's very difficult to reverse them you know, without some sort of catalyst and that creates the need to call it rejigger the entirety of the global energy supply chain uh, when you begin to do that you cause issues right we've, we've seen natural gas in Europe skyrocket, we've seen crude oil skyrocket. Uh, those things are not short-term issues, right? It takes a long time to rebalance and recalibrate uh, the global energy markets. And I think one of the best examples of this is India and the, the way that they've approached uh, the current uh, situation for them. They are an oil importer, uh, one, of the, one of the largest, uh, them and uh, China, uh, are tremendous importers of energy. Generally, uh, they don't have much domestically. Uh, India, China actually is like the fifth or sixth largest producer of oil, um, which is something that I think is overlooked far too often. Uh, but India has has to figure out a way to get energy in. And when the spread between the oil that Russia produces, Urals, uh, and Brent uh, crude went to I think it bottomed out at around $40. It's currently somewhere around $30. Uh, that, that creates an incentive for India to go buy the cheaper oil and begin to import it. Uh, but there's there's another kind of, and it was interesting, they did not import, India did not import much energy at all from Russia prior to the invasion of Ukraine. And now you're beginning to see a significant shift in who they buy oil from and at what levels. Uh, there was an article yesterday uh, that stated that they're in uh, they're in negotiations with Rosneft, uh, the Russian oil uh, firm, for three million barrels of oil a day um, over the next uh, I think it was 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's a that's a pretty sizable shift, and that creates a problem for places like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, that were the largest exporters of crude to India. They're now going to see one of their larger customers pivot. And so the question is, you know, does Saudi Arabia, do Iraq, uh, do they begin to sell their oil into, say, Europe, for instance, and help re, um, remove some of the pricing pressures there as they search for a replacement customer to India as India moves to Russia? Uh, so I think this is one, it's the mindset to use when thinking about energy markets. Uh, there are customers that are very, very large that are beginning to move between partners, and that's going to continue, and that's going to help over time alleviate some of the pressures we've seen. Let's focus next on diesel prices. You've described it as the perfect storm for diesel. Diesel prices are setting new daily records. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's again, it, it, comes, it kind of comes back to the reorientation of the energy markets generally. Uh, there's there's a few things. One, we haven't built a refinery in the United States in 50 years, give or take. Uh, that's that's part of the problem. Uh, another another issue is Russia exported a lot of diesel to Europe, and now Europe needs to find a place to buy their diesel. So while 
uh, U.S. demand for diesel is kind of at normal levels, right? We haven't really seen a skyrocketing demand for diesel, um, which normally it would take to have prices like this. Uh, it's because we're exporting a lot of diesel to Europe, and you know that's that's causing some of these, it ca causing a lot of these issues, particularly on the East Coast uh, with uh, potential shortages of diesel. Uh, it's going to be interesting how markets adapt to that because I do think that it's going to become a significantly political issue if you continue to have diesel prices rise, not because we don't necessarily have enough diesel. We do have enough diesel uh, and enough capacity at the moment to meet the diesel demand. Uh, it's mostly because we're having to export a significant amount of it to Europe. So I think that's going to become an increasingly political issue as we move forward. And how about gasoline? It's a, it's a similar issue. Um, it's a similar issue, except we're nowhere near the demand uh, for gasoline that we were 10 years ago. Uh, we were actually pretty flat to slightly down. Uh, it's almost as though demand destruction doesn't really matter in this market. We simply don't have enough global capacity to make up for, uh, call it the lack of Russian gasoline flowing to Europe and the developed world. That That is a significant issue. Uh, so it's not so much that the U.S. doesn't have enough gasoline for the U.S., it's that the U.S. doesn't have enough gasoline for the world. What happens if we do get demand destruction? Uh, not basically nothing. That's that's kind of the problem. Uh, you could have a pretty significant demand destruction and still not have enough gasoline for call it a normal economy. Right? If you begin to decelerate, uh, call it global demand somewhat, you know, significantly, you know, like a, call it a recession that's not COVID-like, you're still not going to have enough stocks of gasoline to be comfortable. It's going to take a very long time to replenish uh, what we've drawn down. And unless you know we have another work from home type situation, uh, it's going to be very difficult to have China reopen, the US begin to uh, move towards more of a normalized economy. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't even matter if you know it's part work from home, part go to the office. As long as you still have some going to the office and commuting, that's going to at least put somewhat of a floor on the price for gasoline. So I would say demand destruction would be a positive for gasoline prices, but it's not going to be the positive that it once was. And how about U.S. refinery utilization? It's through the roof. Uh, you're, you're kind of back to what you would expect um, for this type of market. And the other thing to remember here is that they're, they're old. These refineries are not new. These are not young refineries that you can really ramp up and run near or close to 100%. They require quite a bit of downtime. They require a lot of maintenance, et cetera. Uh, so if we begin to call it, go through the driving summer months with this type of utilization on refineries, uh, and you're already sitting at five, per, you know, five dollar gasoline, six dollar gasoline, seven dollar gasoline, it's it's not a great sign uh, at all. Uh, and it's going to be pretty difficult to move this north of 95 percent. Right. It's going to be very difficult to maintain those types of levels. Um, you're more than likely going to begin to see some uh, have to go down for maintenance, particularly towards the end of the summer uh, when they've been running this hard. So it's. I think this is one of those pieces of the puzzle where it looks like there's a little bit of refining capacity in the system. There really isn't that much at all at the moment. Sam, as we continue to balance this process, what should we be looking for next? What will it take to help ease the pain? Uh, you need European demand destruction, and you need it in a pretty big way. Um, that that would be helpful on the margin for diesel and gasoline prices. Um, that's that's really called the marginal consumer of American crude now is Europe. Uh, we're going. I think it's the end of this year will be the largest LNG uh, exporter. Uh, with Europe being one of our larger customers, uh, this is this type of thing is going to put a floor underneath a lot of our energy prices that I don't think are in a lot of models uh, at the moment. This this will be a little bit more of an expensive electricity market. Uh, electricity tends to be priced on natural gas, uh, so until you really begin to see natural gas prices come down, and we've seen nine dollar, eight dollar natural gas in the U.S., until you begin to see that come down, you're going to continue to have pricing pressure on the energy front, uh, uh, on you know producing things, manufacturing, uh, high users of electricity. Um, that's going to spiral through 
can maybe have a marginal effect on the demand for energy and crude products across the well, across the landscape. Uh, but you really need to see that European demand come down at least on the margin. Uh, and if from everything you hear, instead of actually allowing demand destruction to happen, uh, you're having policymakers, you know, give people money to continue consuming, uh, and that really distorts the demand destruction front and likely makes this uh, called a long, uh, a higher for longer process. Sam, thank you for all of your thoughts today. We appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We are client driven. If you have any questions or feedback on future topics, please let us know. For any questions or further information on Arbor Research, Bianca Research, or Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.